Hi, this is Miss Slitton, and this is a very teeny tiny Weston and Vinay review of chapter 14. And those of you using this review, it's only happening because two students walked in on this Friday before vacation to stay and review it. So you, you should thank them, both Weston and Vinay. Um, okay, so chapter 14, biotech. Um, I The first part I just wanna impress upon you that you would know examples of cloning just in general that happens naturally like with plants or bacteria or twins but then we want to know I, the idea that you're making um, identical copies of a single gene in a clone and um, then if you're talk if you take that clone gene and you put it in an organism like a bacterium every single time the bacteria replicates it's cloning that gene for you, making a copy as well. Okay, um, we then, we looked at some examples like of recombinant technology, DNA technology, and for that you wanna hear recombined and that um, recombinant DNA has DNA from two different sources. Uh, we also then kind of moved into the tools of a genetic engineer and in order to cut DNA, your chemical scissors are restriction enzymes, or another name for them is restriction endonucleases. And why they are so effective is two reasons. One, they cut at a specific series of bases called a recognition sequence. So these are not random cuts. These are cuts in specific locations. And if you know the gene, the DNA base sequences around the gene that you want to try to isolate, then you choose a restriction enzyme that will cut at that, at that area. You can also engineer um, va um, vectors. Um, and you can engineer plasmids so they have specific recognition sequences so you can cut and paste genes at will. Um, the second reason restriction enzymes are helpful are those that cut, instead of a blunt cut, they cut across and create a sticky end. And those sticky ends are referred to as being sticky because they want to bind with another segment of DNA. Um, and they can make those um, hydrogen bonds between the complementary DNA bases. And those are those overhangs or sticky ends. Okay, we talked about plasmids being vectors and also viruses can be vectors though as well. Here's another example of sticky ends. This one is showing you, because there's light red and dark red, that the DNA you're joining is from two different sources. And as long as you cut them with the same restriction enzyme and they have the same base pairs exposed, you can stick them together and you just have to use ligase um, to seal it. And then once you have genetically engineered that plasmid, you can insert it in a bacterium and it will make clones of that DNA. Oh, we have a third individual on this Friday afternoon. Welcome. <laughs> You can make clones of that um, bacteria and um, you can either isolate the DNA from there or you can isolate the protein, protein product that you're after. We needed to keep in mind that when you're working with human or eukaryotic DNA as opposed to prokaryotic DNA, you, you have to, actually for both, you have to have a regulatory region. You have to have an area where you can turn the gene on so it can be expressed. And by regulatory region, you need a place where RNA polymerase can bind to a promoter. Second, you cannot have any introns um, for prokaryotic cells because they don't have the ability to cut out the introns and then isolate those exons. You don't have the chemicals that you need um, um, around to um, ensure that you are turning that gene on. So in order to make sure you have a clean copy, um, if you start with the mRNA and work backwards, the messenger RNA for coding for that particular protein and use something like reverse transcriptase that retroviruses use, you can make a clean DNA copy and then insert that and you can clone that gene. And um, then third, you need a vector and our vectors are either plasmids or viruses. Okay, um, if you want more DNA, and um, whether you're investigating a crime or you're looking for um, signs of cancer or you're looking at phylogenetic relationships and you want to have more DNA, you can use um, a process called PCR, the polymerase chain reaction, and basically you're forcing DNA replication. Um, what a thermocycler will do 
is it will, um, you will put primers in that will basically mark off the region of the DNA that you want replicated because you know DNA polymerase won't do replication unless we have a primer that's put down there. So identify the region around the DNA, um, have primers that will um, attach to that single-stranded DNA, and it's made single-stranded because the thermocycler will heat the DNA up. Primers will adhere. You need to have DNA polymerase, and it needs to be a polymerase that can withstand the fluctuations in the temperatures and the extreme heat without denaturing. That's why if you use something like Thermus aquaticus, um, Archaea, if you use a polymerase from that um, organism who can withstand that extreme heat, um, then it would work. And you also need a bunch of nucleotides, DNA nucleotides, in order to build that complementary DNA strand. So that's how a thermocycler works for DNA replication. Um, here I'm bringing up Thermus aquaticus. And then to view it, you use gel electrophoresis. Now what gel electrophoresis does is it helps you to visualize fragments of DNA, sizes of DNA. And so you load the DNA in on, um, oh, guys, you should have told me. I'm sitting here talking and you can't see anything. I can see it on my screen. So I'm like, <laughs> for the record, this whole thing, they couldn't see anything, but I could. Um, <laughs> very quiet. Is that better? Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm like, why aren't they interacting with the picture? Um, you load the DNA into wells. Maybe. You load that DNA into wells. It looks like it froze again. Hold on. Yeah, it froze again because I can see it online. There we go. And then you turn on an electric current and the DNA will move through the gel and the smallest pieces can move the what? Furthest. Furthest, fastest. Yeah, the furthest through the gel. Okay, and um, just a rem reminder that for us, DNA is in other locations as well, um, in our mitochondria or a plant in their chloroplast and their mitochondria. And when you're looking um, at mitochondrial DNA, you want to remind yourself that it's only getting passed through the mother's line. All right, um, using something like gel electrophoresis and short tandem repeats, if you remember from your class last year, those are just like repeating sections of DNA like CTGG, CTGG, CTGG. You can count up how many of those repeats that you have and you can cut around those regions after you've amplified it through PCR and do gel electrophoresis to identify those. FBI uses 13 different areas on chromosomes in order to uh, make comparisons and identify um, suspects. All right, and I saw the cans post. Yes. Do you still have them? Or do you want me to pick them up? Oh, they came by and got oh, them. Okay. <laughs> You're so sweet. Bye. Thank you, sweetheart. Do you want me to go through these questions with you? Yes? Yes. Okay. So, these enzymes are needed to introduce um, foreign DNA into a vector. So which, which enzymes would we use? You want me to just go over the answers because you don't want to say? Or do you want to say? Because Yeah. You need restriction enzymes to do the cutting and ligase to do the taping. Okay. Why don't I need DNA polymerase for this type of step? Because you're not trying to make copies. I'm not trying to make more copies. Good job. Good job. Okay, um, during PCR reaction, the DNA sample is heated in order to separate, separate into single strands. Excellent. Which ones of those? All of them, yes. For bacterials to express it, it can't have in introns. You could use reverse transcriptase in order to avoid the introns to go from mRNA to DNA. You have to have a way to turn that gene on once you've inserted it, and you need a way to get the gene in there, some sort of vector, so. Okay, and looking at this, who possibly committed the crime? Suspect two. Yeah, suspect two. 
um, B because it has that same, um, same pattern. Okay, then we went into biotechnology products and basically you're either manipulating bacteria, you're manipulating plants, or you're manipulating animals. And of those three, transgenic bacteria are the easiest to, to work with. Um, and so there I have ones that degrade oil, that isolate ores, that could, if sprayed on a plant, possibly make it frost resistant. So you can kind of go through and look at some of, the, some of those. To genetically engineer plants, you need to get that DNA in. It's a little more difficult um, because of their cellulose, the cell walls. So you ha usually work with um, protoplasts, which is basically embryonic like stems, uh, embryonic uh, plant cells that the cell walls have been removed. Something that you might genetically engineer is crops that make their own pesticide, so you don't have to spray it. Um, the ability to grow uh, plants, let's say, in um, water that has salt in it, um, genetically engineer and protect the skins of a plant or make them produce more fruit or larger fruit. Um, and there are eight commercial, commercially available um, genetically modified products now. Two, you could put medicines in them um, as a way to deliver medicine as well. Okay, transgenic animals, those are difficult, not super efficient because there's two, in, uh, I don't think I want the word efficient. Your chances of success are fairly low because you have to get the DNA into, um, into the nucleus. And so um, you have, you, you know you have euchromatin and heterochromatin, some DNA is available, not available to get it in the exact right place. Um, once you have genetically um, engineered that nucleus, then you can't do sexual reproduction to make more. You have to remove a, a cell, remove the nucleus from that cloned organism and put it into a cell that's been enucleated where the nucleus has been removed in order to grow up another one. And the problem is, is they age out so fast because you know we talked about methylating our DNA and so all of the contents of the cell could be older and then the, the, could have influenced the DNA and that's why you have to start with an egg cell but you have to, without damaging the egg, remove the nucleus and, and put a different nucleus in. So it is a fairly difficult process, but they have genetically engineered cats and sheep, um, a few goats um, as well. And then the idea might be is to genetically engineer them so you can get some product, some eukaryotic product, that uh, mammalian product, let's say from another mammal that you wanna have, and then you can harvest it from them. Okay, and the questions. Oh, genetically engineering mice so that you put in the Siri gene so you make female mice um, um, male. And then the knockout mouse is where they remove some of the genes that for it to be, they make it basically force it to have some sort of mutation so that you can try different drug treatments. Okay, so which of these statements is true? Let's go through each one. Can plasmids serve as vectors? Yes. Can plasmids carry recombinant DNA but viruses cannot? No. The yeah, other, both vectors. Vectors carry only the foreign gene, no. And only gene therapy uses, no, use vectors all the time. Okay, so A was right on that one. Which of these is not needed to clone an animal and we would say sperm, right? Because you're not doing sexual reproduction. So you do not need any sperm, but you do need a nucleus from an adult animal cell, an enucleated egg, so you can put that nucleus in there and then a host for it to develop in. Okay, then we talked about ex vivo and in vivo gene therapy. Um, and it sounds, this time it works for us because it is what it says. In vivo, you're doing it in the, you're inserting in the virus or the, um, the lipid of some sort to be a vector. Um, right in, maybe it's a nose spray. Um, ex vivo, you're removing the cells, trying to fix them with a virus and then returning them. So those are the two types of gene therapy. Okay, then we went into genomics, and if you recall from class, genomics, you're studying the human genome, and you're making comparisons between other organisms, and the technology to do that has improved vastly. But, but we know that we have to relook at the central dogma, because we, before we just said, okay, DNA codes for RNA and RNA codes for proteins, and proteins are our product, our end result. 
So we are saying if we understand the DNA, then we understand the proteins. But we know that's not always true because you could have one gene code for several different proteins. Um, or what it's coding for could be like a small interfering RNA strand to help re regulate. So the end product is not the protein, maybe the end product is the RNA. So we talked about things like um, comparing the genomes um, to look at different organisms, but we also said just looking at humans and comparing our DNA. And that a very small percentage of, of our DNA is actually expressed, and of that, maybe only 0.1% of all of our DNA is unique to us. Um, and so looking at those regions of the DNA that are unique to us, and this could affect things like drug treatments, um, dosaging, um, et cetera. And we looked at um, single nucleotide polymorphism, sometimes it causes a huge problem if it codes for mRNA that gives us the wrong amino acid and sometimes it causes no problems. Um, we discussed um, intragenic and intergenic. Um, if, if um, as you see in the first scenario, gene A, it, th that is intragenic, you have some sort of um, difference in the nucleotide uh, polymorphism within the gene, that could be very bad. If you have it outside of the gene in the intergenic, the inter intervening sequences, it, it's not going to be um, as big of a problem. And we looked at um, genetic profiling and the ability now for them to literally print the 30,000 genes, different genes we have onto a slide and then compare, um, maybe mutate to if they put a bad copy of the gene or a good copy of the gene and do you have a copy of one of those and you can make all sorts of comparisons in your genetic profile. You can identify whether you're a carrier for a disease. Um, we studied proteomics, is looking at the three-dimensional fo folding of proteins, what proteins are available, and that is a whole new research. And the, the genome is much smaller than the proteome. We have more proteins out there than we do actually DNA. Bioinformatics is whether you're looking at the proteins or the DNA, you're involving computers and the computational abilities of computers to make comparisons. and. Um, then they're looking more into those intergenic sequences, the in between the genes and how they might be regulatory or um, um, affect um, the way um, medications, drugs, et cetera, use. And that was our biotechnology. Okay, and let's do this. So gene therapy, is it still an investigative procedure? Yes. Um, has it met with no success? No, it's met with some success. It's not used to only cure skid um, or cystic fibrosis. Um, and does it make use of viruses to carry foreign genes into human cells? Yes, it does. What is the answer on this one? B, yeah. So a retrovirus, remember you're gonna use a retrovirus and it can insert it in, there's nothing about eliminating steps. And which one was the incorrect one? Yeah, because protoplast is just plant cells without a cell wall, it, it's not a vector. And that is the end. Do you guys have any questions on that? Honk and chapter and you reviewed it in 18 minutes and 59 seconds. And if you waited till all of Thanksgiving break and now it's Sunday night, the night before you have to go back to school, I hope you had a great Thanksgiving and now school's starting. So um, if you're up really late on Sunday getting ready for this quiz, have a piece of toast.